Hi. Um, I'll invite everyone to take a seat. We are going to get started with the Women in Space panel. This is the first time that the space policy dialogue uh, process here has included this topic, and I think it's both timely and inspiring. Um, I won't do personal introductions because we have a highly accomplished but also very well-known uh, list of panelists here, um, many of whom don't need an introduction. Uh, we'll go sort of in order for talks. Uh, we'll have discussion at the end, and we're supposed to try to wrap up around 4.45 just so that everyone is aware of our, our timeline going forward, because we're a little bit behind. Um, so we'll start with Sumitra Mahati. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Raji, can I ask if my presentation has already been loaded onto the resident laptop? Or uh, Pulkit, Nandini? Raji? Is my presentation already loaded onto the resident laptop? I would like to use my slides. Yeah. OK. All right, let's start with a quick introduction while we figure out if my slide deck is already um, on the laptop. Um, I, when you know half of your panelists, well, in this case, all of my panelists, uh, you know that your life has come full circle. I was born in the early 70s, uh, grew up in Ahmedabad with Vikram Sarabhai's dream team. Uh, so in a sense, the pioneers of the Indian Space Program. And I went on to start my professional career in the late 90s. Uh, I had a short stint at NASA Johnson in Houston. And um, what I'll do is I'll try and walk you through uh, my space trajectory, so to speak. Uh, which will kind of set the context for a discussion amongst us and with everybody present. So let's see if my slides are here. It's two minutes, okay. So I started um, uh, with NASA Johnson, where this was the time when the Americans and the Russians started collaborating and the Atlantis, Space Shuttle Atlantis, was adapted to dock with the Mir space station. Um, so my, the months I spent at Johnson, I was part of several uh, tests that were going on, um, everything from physiological countermeasures to, to tests where they were trying to see what's the difference between men and women docking the shuttle to the Mir space station, um, I looked at four shuttle Mir missions as part of my, if you, if you can call it a residency, a scholarly residency, uh, where I had to analyze astronaut debriefs uh, and look at habitability issues, sleep, food, air quality, ergonomics, light. Um, and these might seem to be um, sort of softer, intangible qualities, but they're very important when you're designing something for human space exploration. Uh, and while at NASA, I also had the opportunity to train for parabolic flights. After that, I went on to work for Boeing in Southern California for the space station program. And being a foreign national, I didn't work on design projects, but I worked in international business development. So ours was the only team within the space station program which was making money for the, for the program. Everybody else was spending it. In fact, for those of you who are familiar with the ISS program, you might remember that the initial budget was, I think, 17.4 billion. And we stopped counting after we crossed 100. Um, so I think the space station program experience at Boeing was the foundation for me in terms of understanding how international contracts work. How do you negotiate? What advantage do the Japanese have over the Americans when it comes to negotiating? Uh, why do the Europeans come to Boeing for hardware through NASA and not directly as the Japanese do? So I learned a lot about what I would call the nature of the beast, how the aerospace industry works, how the mega corporations work, right? So it was a fascinating uh, three years for me in terms of learning how things happen in the international space world. Um, after that, um, I decided it was time to move on and start my own company, um, primarily because when you work for someone 
whether it's a government space agency or a company, you can't speak your mind. So I think the reason I chose to become an entrepreneur back in the year 2000 was pretty simple. I wanted the freedom and the mobility to do things to change the status quo in the space world. So I left Boeing in uh, 2000 and moved to San Francisco. I used to be in Huntington Beach. And I started my first company with a friend, a fellow alumni from the International Space University. So I've had other slides up so I can sort of walk you through with some visuals. I think that's a pity. Okay, so while I continue talking, I think I'm going to give them my USB and then continue talking. So my first company um, was called Moonfront, and this was based in San Francisco. Uh, it was a boutique consulting firm. We were six partners, and it was a learning experience for someone like me who was a first-generation entrepreneur. And back then, by the way, the word startup wasn't a big deal. And these days, the word startup has been sort of beaten to death. I mean, everybody's a startup, right? So back then, it was just a small company. And we did all kinds of unusual projects, like putting NASA on Second Life, having a very exciting future moon-based workshop at STEC in Norchwijk. Uh, we, we also did work with some of the nonprofits in California. We celebrated the year 2001 um, <laughs> with Hollywood actors who were interested in space uh, on the Playboy Mansion grounds where we beamed Arthur Clarke live as a 3D hologram for the, for the celebrations. How many of you have seen the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey? That is very few, guys, given that this is a space audience. Uh, by the way, how many of you know that Kubrick actually adapted the movie from a Czech movie called Ikari XB1? OK, Paris is getting too many points here. So anyway, so I think all of you space guys ought to be a little bit into the space world, sort of immerse yourself, you know, and not sort of tangentially relate to it. Uh, after that, I started my second company in Vienna, in Austria. It's called Liquifer. And the idea behind Liquifer was that we wanted to move away from the engineering-centric way of designing exploration systems. And when I, mean, what I, when I say exploration systems, I'm referring to habitats, rovers, spacesuits, suit boats, so everything that you would use for human exploration. Because the NASA's of the world, most space agencies of the world, don't have openings for architects or industrial designers. It's mostly engineers. So even if you were an architect and be hired by one of these agencies, you would be called a systems engineer or something like that. So our idea with Liquifer was, how do we move away from the engineering-centric approach to a multidisciplinary approach? where architects, designers, engineers, ergonomists, color theorists should sort of work together. And this year, Vienna, the company turns 15. So yes, it is possible, guys, to be an entrepreneur and reach your 15th anniversary. So we are planning a retrospective of my Vienna company in some of the major cities in the world, where we are planning to exhibit some of our work that we've done over the past 15 years. So not only do we design things, we build prototypes of habitats and rovers and so on. The latest thing and the most exciting thing we're doing in the Vienna company is we finished working on a greenhouse project for the space station, and that's being tested in Antarctica. We're also looking at 3D printing. How are we going to use 3D printing to build habitats on other planets? I moved back to India in 2008, and... Um, uh, the first thing I did is look around. I went to meet the people who were already working on India's human space program. How many of you are aware that India has tested a space capsule twice? India has tested a scaled version of the space shuttle once. India is planning a residential astronaut training facility outside of Bangalore in Devanahalli. Nobody in the audience, you see. Oh, there are some, okay. I think, I think one of the things where we fall short as a country is we don't share enough with the public. There is very little information out there which can be exciting for young people. Um, but anyway, I think, I think um, 
in, in 2008, one of the other things I did is I looked at the satellites we were building, the rockets we had, and I had one of my interns add up all the payloads we had launched for foreign, foreign countries uh, from 1999 to 2008. Okay, so I think we have some slides, yes? So let's just go back. So that's where I started my space career with the shuttle Mir missions back in the late 90s. Um, and then I think it should be the International Space Station, but that's my San Francisco company, Moonfront, which I had for seven years. Um, that's Earth to Orbit, the India venture. So with Earth to Orbit, um, what we found out with some basic math back in 2008 is that India, as an ISRO, had launched a total of about 1,500 kilograms in terms of foreign payloads on the PSLV. And for those of you who are aware of the launch program for India, the first PSLV was launched in 1993. So I thought to myself that here we have a rocket which is very reliable, very mature for its class. So maybe it's time that the PSLV sort of competed in the international market. So India has a very accomplished space program. Um, however, our role in the international space market is very limited. So I took it upon myself to try and get the Americans to launch on the PSLV and the Japanese to launch on the PSLV. Because the Europeans come to ISRO, the diplomatic relations have always been sort of happy, and it's, it's an easy sell. But the Americans and the Japanese were not exactly fine flying on the PSLV. So that was the focus of Earth to Orbit for the first five years. My American client Skybox Imaging from California, which also happens to be the first, it's a Stanford startup, which, which happens to be the first space company to raise private funding in the valley. See, everybody else, including Elon Musk, they depend on taxpayer dollars from the government, right? So in that sense, Skybox was remarkable for having raised some VC money. And they became our first client. We, um, it took us three years to get what is called a TAA from the US State Department. We had two big hurdles, right? One was the US embargo of 1998. How many of you are familiar with that? It still exists, by the way. And the ITAR regime. I'm sure everybody here who's worked uh, sort of in international programs is familiar with an export control regime which was sort of written back in the late six, in, in the 60s during the Cold War. And there's been very little reform on that front. How many of you, if you're familiar with the ITAR regime? Great, so if anything is manufactured in the United States, such as, say, the remote, and it needs to fly on a foreign rocket, it's a defense article, right? The only reform that we saw was during the Obama administration, any significant reform, where he moved some of the space components from the, I believe, uh, the State Department to the Trade Department, or maybe I'm wrong, but I think he made it easier for American businesses to sell space components. So we flew the... Skybox satellite on the PSLV in 2016. Skybox became the first American company to have a launch agreement with the Indian Space Agency in April of 2014. And by the time they launched, Google acquired Skybox. So we ended up launching a Google satellite. I won't go too much into this. Let's uh, look at a little bit what is it that I'm focusing on now. I went to Antarctica in 2017 uh, as part of the first cultural expedition to the icy continent. I have also been to the Arctic back in 2009 on invitation from the Swedish uh, Space Physics Institute up in Kiruna. And I think one of the things that's really worrying me, as it must worry many of you out there, is the accelerated pace of climate change given human activities. And you don't have to go to Antarctica to know that is, it is real. You can go to the Himalayas, you can see how your cities are changing, you can see how the coastal environment has changed. So I think for us as a community, whether we are entrepreneurs or policy makers or government civil servants, I think if we don't ha focus on planetary ROI, what is it that what we are doing is affecting, how is it affecting our planet? I don't think the planet will last very long. In my view, even though I'm a diehard optimist, I think in another three to four generations, um, the Earth will not be very habitable anymore. 
I think we will live in a dystopic future where we'll be wearing you know, masks and other such technological uh, support systems to even get us through the day. With that, I think I'll call it, I'll, I'll wrap up my conversation and hand it over back to Jessica. Thank you. So on that really somber note, um, we'll turn the floor over to Commander Khatri. Thank you. Uh, I think it's a very generic topic, and I'm going to just uh, talk about uh, my, my journey in this sector and uh, probably, uh, you know, uh, some of the thoughts that I've had on how do women exist in the industry. And... Uh, also probably, you know, breaking the ceiling. Uh, primarily, uh, you know, I've spent about 24 years uh, now in the industry. Uh, started my career in the government uh, as a part of the uh, initial, you know, courses of women officers who were commissioned back in 1993. Uh, interesting times. Uh, and uh, I would say, you know, there have been a lot of debates at various times wherein, uh, you know, human beings have debated over whether women should be in such and such industry, whether it's space or, you know, any other industry, that those questions have always been there in the professional world. Uh, what amazes me is the fact that you know, a pickup country like India, wherein you have uh, a very good system of uh, education for children, uh, if you compare it with some of the other developing countries. Uh, yet, when you look at mid-level managers and senior leaders in the industry, uh, there's a huge lacuna. Uh, you don't find more than seven to eight percent of women leaders in any organizations. Uh, you don't find, uh, you know, uh, women in mid-level managers too. Uh, and, and what are those reasons? I think I am, I am always a person who, who like to sit back and talk about, uh, you know, the, the, the reasons for why it's not happening in this industry specifically. I think, uh, to my understanding, uh, primarily space and aerospace as such uh, industry have been, you know, any which way limited for, for, for uh, you know, women to be existing there for whatever reasons. Uh, maybe there are there are less number of female, um, you know, students who enter into it. Uh, maybe less numbers enter but can't make it to uh, uh, the professional world, or whatever be the reason. So inherently, uh, you know. Uh, especially in the professional world, you see a lack. If you actually look at the government organizations um, uh, numbers, the organizations like uh, DRDOs, ISRO, I think I feel very, very happy looking at it. Uh, you do see some very credible uh, names uh, on, on major projects. Uh, I've interacted with many of them. Uh, uh, I hear that the next major manned mission uh, being supported by, uh, b being undertaken by ISRO is uh, taking over three women. I don't know if it's right or wrong, but I've been reading those. Uh, I hope it's true. Uh, but my, my personal uh, experience on being in the Indian Air Force, uh, you know, you, you can actually have organizations coming up with very, very lame or illogical I would say, you know, uh, uh, talks on why women should or should not be there. Uh, so, for example, when, when we were training to become officers, uh, one of the first discussion was, uh, so I come from the batch of the, uh, the initial officers, and we were taken as first five years of short service. You know, so I always used to call ourselves the, the experimental goats. Uh, uh, it was tough. So you got five years, and then you finished five years, and then some of us were dropped off because they did not perform well, which is fair, you know. Uh, uh, the others who could survive were given another five years, and, and rest yet another five years, so a maximum of 15 years, and then, you know, short service commission, you have to leave after 15 years. And then some of us got together and went to the Indian 
court and said, that's unfair. Why are we you know, made to let go into a, from the professional world when we are, when we are doing well? And uh, so the high court gives order saying, no, take these women back. So after two years, we were taken back. Uh, you got two years of salary, etc. I, I was the only fool who did not go back. I went to join KPMG, uh, but you know my, my course mates went back and joined the Air Force. And 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 in those days, I remember they said, you know, if the women could work on do ground duties, engineering, aerospace, blah blah blah, why can't they be pilots? Back in 94, 95. So we we would we would hear things like. Oh, the, the length of the leg is shorter for women. So because, you know, to be a pilot, you need to control rudders on your legs. I mean, I've had a lot of male officers who were shorter than me. I'm not tall, but I've seen many of them. So, uh, and the other questions that probably the Indian Army and Indian Navy has raised is, what happens in case of war? You know, what if women officers are captured? I mean, if I go on to become a soldier, I think it's my prerogative to think about my own safety. The fact that I'm choosing this as a profession is the fact that I'm not scared of that scenario. It's as good or bad as a question as it is applied to men. So, uh, but, but it's taken, you know, it amazes me that I was commissioned in 94, and actually last year we had the first three women fighter pilots commissioned in the Indian Air Force. So it amazes me to see how long the Indian officials took to take that decision that, OK, we could have a couple of Indian women who could be pilots, or rather fighter pilots. They did have helicopters and transport pilots uh, right in the beginning. So, uh, But at the, at the same time, I mean, this is India, so it's not just the women. The other, I mean, the good feel-good factor is for any kind of decision, we always take that kind of time to. Uh, we are slow and steady people. I remember talking to uh, the current U.S. Uh, ambassador to India, and he was saying, you know, working in India is like, uh, you know, you see this huge traffics um, on on those main um, uh, roads in India. Uh, it's all, you know, a cow working, uh, a bullock cart, and this and that, and then somehow it magically streams down and merges and still moves. So, I mean, that's <laughs> that's a good, um, uh, I would say, logic to be giving to yourself. Uh, at the same time, what amazes me is the grit with which uh, the Indian professional uh, women in this industry have been working. I've seen some amazing... Uh, you know, leaders working in the uh, setting up the engineering operations uh, for small companies into large global OEMs. I've seen some really good talent being um, uh, hunted by the global companies and actually exported out of India uh, as, as um, leaders. Uh, so, so I would say the ground is not very even for women in this industry. At the same time, a lot of focus needs to be given by women themselves on themselves. I think I'm a strong believer of that sentence that I'm saying. We, I mean, while it's good to point out what's not available for us to grow, uh, a huge amount of onus lies on uh, women professional on themselves, uh, on how do you think you should behave or um, you know, make use of the threats to turn it into opportunities for yourself. I am a strong believer in that. So therefore, you know, whether you call it your own survivor instincts on how would you behave. Uh, the one last point that I would say uh, right now is, uh, you know, and this is one of my very favorite uh, uh, point because I myself suffer from, from that complex. Um, and, and, and that is something which, which is very naturally inbuilt into every human cell in men. Uh, pardon me, all the men sitting here. You know, uh, you, you talk to anybody, uh, and th that's not actually a negative for men to have. They are superbly confident people. Hum men, Indian, uh, I mean, men as such in general, are superbly confident, uh, you know, species. And on the other hand, women are superbly underconfident species. Please use this statement, and I kind of always remember it. I mean, I'll give you some of my very simple examples, you know. 
There might be topics that I'm superbly confident of. I know I have worked on those kind of projects earlier. But when it comes to me at any stage, uh, you know, the first instinct is always like, oh my god, can I do it? And you pick up a, uh, a man and you give him a project which he may not have any idea of how to do it. And he would say, yeah, I can do it. <laughs> that's, that's the basic difference between a man and a woman. So, and I, I'll, give you, I'll give you a very live examples, you know. So there was a time when I was in one of the MNC board. I was one of the first women to get into the board of this company. And you walk into the boardroom, you know. And for me, it was the first. So I'm con underconfident. Was it anything that I didn't know? I knew it like the back of my hand. I was working already into, uh, you know, advisory earlier, telling companies how to, do, how to run boards, telling companies how to handle their meetings and decisions. And I walk into it as one of the board members. And, and you know how, how men would sit in those companies, uh, in those meetings? I'll, I'll, excuse me. So they would sit like, <laughs> like this. <laughs> and you know what I did when I entered into that meeting? And I realized this as a, I, I actually learned it after that meeting. You know, I have this habit of thinking about myself end of the every day. So the moment I enter, or for that matter, I can challenge anybody, any woman sitting here would do that is, you actually sit like this. You know? So, so that talks about your confidence. And I think at any industry, especially in this industry, which is like superbly <laughs> crowded with men, all you women out there, please stick out, be more confident, work with some more, uh, you know, uh, with your guts. And I'm sure, you know, be, be at it, be steady in your performance. I'm sure you guys will do well. Okay, now we'll turn it to Ashok to share some words. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Ashok. I'm an attorney uh, practicing with a firm called Factum Law. So besides my work as a lawyer uh, with commercial litigation, I also do some work with uh, the LGBTQ communities and victims of sexual violence. And today, I represent the minority in this panel. <laughs> OK, so um, I'm kind of slightly, uh, uh, I'm le letting my imagination run a little loose today. So what I will be exploring in my presentation is uh, the future of the gender narrative when we talk about space exploration, right? So before we start, just want to do a small exercise. Uh, can all of us just take a deep breath? Right? And I'm sure all of you have water around yourself, so you'll be able to appreciate that anytime you feel nervous, you are able to take a quick sip of water. And if you find my presentation offensive, you can walk out of this room, and you're not deprived of oxygen. right? So just keep this in mind, because this is a very central topic to the rest of my presentation. OK, so let's look at gender in the context of space exploration. right? So we had the first uh, astronaut in uh, 1984. Uh, from then until very recently, the overall representation of women in the community of astronauts was about 11%. And uh, very early on, a lot of stereotypes came in the way of women being inducted as astronauts. And then there was a very famous study by a gentleman called Randolph Lovelace, who started uh, uh, looking at what is the impact of space travel on women and how suitable is it for women to actually venture into space. And before you think it's very progressive, his motives was that if one day we're going to live in space, we will need secretaries, we will need telephone operators. So it's high time we started talking about how we can put women in space. So the motives of the study was, was, was rather patriarchal. Right? And I will also explore a related concept which often gets lost in the subject of gender, which is the doctrine of privacy. Uh, right? So privacy in this context can be both a problem as well as a solution. So let's look at how gender stereotypes became as skewed as they are right now. Right? So, what determines uh, the gender identity in, in the traditional sense? Uh, more often than not, it's birth. When you're born, a quick determination is made as to whether you're a man or a woman. 
and the moment the determination is made that you're either a man or a woman, automatically you get placed under certain categories of man or woman, and it comes with all the corresponding baggages. Uh, women being underconfident, men being overconfident, all these are stereotypes that we have uh, started developing. I mean, as a man here, I feel very nervous, by the way. <laughs> So uh, now these stereotypes may be wrong, may be right. We don't know until we get into the nitty gritty of the stereotype itself. But a lot of the discrimination perpetuated against women as a gender actually comes from a very unique concept of spatial luxuries. If you look at places of worship in which men and women are segregated, or places of worship where women are not allowed, or practices in certain communities where menstrual, uh, menstruating women are actually isolated from the community, what has made the, uh, the aspect of discrimination possible is also the fact that space is available in abundance, and therefore it is open and easy for people to actually segregate the two genders and isolate one from the other. Right? Just keep this in mind. Now, the moment we talk about gender stereotypes, we see that there are certain uh, you know, misplaced theories around each gender. Men are known to be strong, you're not. Uh, we are sensible, my wife will certainly dispute that. Uh, we are providers uh, with my income, I don't feel that way, <laughs> right? And we are patriarchal, most certainly yes, <laughs> right? And women are considered weak, emotionally unstable, stereotyped into homemaking roles, dependent, all misplaced stereotypes around men and women. But in the context of space exploration, do we have the luxuries of, of these kind of stereotypes? So let us look at how gender has been evolving, because I think the future of space exploration cannot be separated from the future of gender itself. Right? So first and foremost, what used to be determined by birth is now considered a choice. All right? uh, so within the doctrine of privacy, there evolved two concepts of bodily autonomy and uh, bodily integrity. I have the right to make my own choices, and I have the right not to be damaged. Now, these uh, concepts were introduced into Indian law by four principal judgments. The National Legal Services Authority of India versus Union of India, the, the other three judgments by various high courts and supreme courts. But the sum and substance of this is that it is not up to somebody else to determine whether I'm a man or a woman. It is up to me to determine whether I'm a man or a woman. Right? So for the first time in several decades, uh, the law now says gender is a product of choice. It is an exercise of autonomy. It is not something that the community gets to impose on you. So let us look at how this works. Right? At the center of the doctrine of privacy lies the individual. Now imagine there's a virtual space around you. Right? And if somebody were to start bringing their hand closer, to closer, closer and closer to your face, at a certain point in time, you will feel like your space is being violated. Right? And that's when you put your foot down and say, sorry, you cannot enter into my space. Right? In a nutshell, this is the doctrine of privacy. Now, privacy assumes different roles and uh, different forms. For example, we have the spatial privacy. The hotel has the right of admission. It can deny entry to somebody that it does not wish to uh, allow inside the premises. We have the right of admission into our own homes. We don't, we don't allow people that we don't trust. Right? So the doctrine of privacy has really emerged in the context of the things we take for granted. The fact that when we go out, there's still air to breathe. The fact that uh, we can move from one house to the other and, and not lose out on fundamental amenities. Space will not allow for these luxuries. So when luxuries of this nature are not available, how feasible is it to, to segregate the genders? And how uh, feasible or viable is it to perpetuate the stereotypes? So now let us look at how privacy is affected in the context of space, right? So for example, in the doctrine of privacy, we have associational privacy, which means I get the right of choosing who my friends are and who I get to live with and who I want to avoid. But in the context of a colony in Mars, those luxuries may not be available. It's a small, limited community, right? So limited space also means that your spatial privacy is limited. If you do not like my speech right now, you can walk out. But in the context of space, that is not an option. Right? You still have to stay within the, the habitat. How will we enforce gender-specific laws? If there is a case of sexual harassment at, at a colony in Mars or, or, say, on the moon, when we know that there is no possibility of putting a space police there without weapons, how are we going to enforce gender-sensitive laws on a community, on an extraterrestrial object? And last but not the least, how are we going to assert boundaries if the space available is limited? So how do we prepare for this? Right? There's a very popular theory that language influences how we think. 
And I think one reason why we have such a difficulty in terms of understanding and appreciating uh, you know, the, the unique contributions of each gender is because the language itself is skewed. Our entire narrative has always been binary. There's, there's a man and there's a woman. And just to explain how complicated this is, I had a case where a male to female transgender ended up marrying a, a, a person who identified herself as a woman. And he got excommunicated from his own transgender community because they felt it was a lesbian relationship that they could not condone. Right? Now just wrap your head around this. A male to female transgender marrying a woman excommunicated by a community of transgenders who do not appreciate a lesbian relationship. Right? Now in this situation, if I were to ask you to define man and a woman, it becomes an extremely confusing concept. Right? But that's gender and sexuality in today's world. It's, it's not binary anymore. There's no simplistic classification of man or a woman. And I think one of the things that we have to do if we are serious about putting colonies uh, in different planets is to unlearn the concept of gender that has, queued, uh, that has entered into our heads. Because right now, those simplistic classifications will not allow us to work together and, and build communities on other terrestrial objects. How will the environment impact human rights? Right? Going back to the first example of taking a deep breath and being able to walk out if you don't like something. Right? That's, that's an exercise of the right of clean air. That's an exercise of the right of privacy, the right to be left alone. Right? But that is on assuming a lot of physical and biological realities on Earth at the moment. Those physical and biological realities will not exist in other planets. So how will we define human rights on a different planet? And this is something that we will have to understand. What will human rights on Mars look like? Refining language, I think gender as a product of birth needs to be uh, demolished once and for all. We have to now start teaching gender as a product of choice. And we have to abandon the binary narrative of gender as just male and female. Because in the, in the atmosphere of space, we are dealing with hostility. We have to work together. Stereotypes around women will not help us work together to build sustainable habitats in other planets. And last but not the least, I think the possibility of colonizing uh, extraterrestrial objects is also a golden opportunity to undo the mistakes of the past. When we have talent, that talent should not be discriminated on the grounds of gender, as we heard so many people say this today. So I think what this represents is an opportunity for mankind, and I, I say this deliberately, to apologize and then say, OK, going forward, we'll not make this mistake. Thank you. Thank you, Ashok. That was stimulating. I never heard anything like that before. My, my mind is spinning with questions. And we'll uh, finish off the panel with Subi. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Raji and uh, the ORF team for inviting me uh, for, to this panel. I would like to begin by asking a question. Why are we here discussing about something that has already been accomplished? We have sent women to space. We have today women who are scientists, engineers, entrepreneurs, who are actively involved in space-related research and development. Why do we still feel the need to add this panel to the dialogue? Of course, the numbers. We have the past and the present that has been going in a certain way. And we would like to see a different future, a better future. As we all know, and I would like to correct Ashok, in 1963, Valentina Tereshkova became the first woman to go to space. Just two years after the first man, Yuri Gagarin. She was there for three days and completed 48 orbits of Earth. I was looking into the profiles of the first humans in space, and what did I find? Yuri and the other men selected for the uh, cosmonauts, uh, selected as the cosmonauts for the Vostok program, were all qualified Air Force pilots. They had the relevant skills, such as the exposure to high G forces, as well as the ejection seat experience. In contrast, the female cosmonauts were required to be parachutists, in addition to fulfilling the age, weight, and height requirements, which were pretty much the same as the men. In fact, Tereshkova was also the first civilian to fly in space, who used to work in a textile factory uh, as an assembly worker and was an amateur skydiver. 
She also stands out as the only woman till date to have flown on a solo space mission. Although she was not a military pilot, during her training she underwent weightless flights, isolation tests, centrifuge tests, courses on rocket theory and spacecraft engineering, 120 parachute jumps and pilot training in fighter jets. None of the other four in Tereshkova's early group flew as they had little support and the pioneering female cosmonaut group dissolved in 1969 when it became clear that no women will be included in the future Soviet flights. It took about a good 20 years until the second woman, as he told, Svetlana Savitskaya, flew to space. So what happened in those 20 years? The Soviet Union went ahead with its WAS code and Soyuz programs, and US went ahead with projects like Project Mercury, Project Gemini, and the prestigious Project Apollo. These programs saw many firsts, like the first multi-man spacecraft, the first space, uh, space, spacewalk, the first space station, etc. In total, more, more than 100 men flew to space, out of which 24 reached an orbit around the moon, out of which 12 walked on the moon's surface. Where were the women? They were not eligible as uh, all astronauts were required to be military test pilots, a career not available to women at the time. Despite all this, in the early 1960s, there was a group of 13 women pilots who were undergoing physical and psychological tests similar to the Mercury 7 astronauts. This was a privately funded program as he told Randolph Lovelace had, uh, was a doctor who was uh, doing all these tests. And these women, who were known as the Mercury 13, proved to be fit and passed all the tests. However, before they could receive any further training, the program got cancelled by the US government. Only in 1976 did US Air Force allow women as equal members. After, uh, and after a couple of years, in response to the new anti-discrimination laws, NASA also opened its doors to the female applicants during the early years of the space shuttle. Space shuttle could carry more passengers than ever, and hence not everyone had to be a military pilot. Subsequently, in 1983, Sally Ride became the first American woman to fly in space as a crew member of the space shuttle Challenger. She was a subject to media attention due to her gender and faced many absurd questions as a result of gender stereotyping. A series of women followed Sally and were all PhD holders in STEM subjects. And finally, there came a lady who sat on the driver's seat. Eileen Collins became the first female pilot and first female commander of the space shuttle in the 90s. Although they suffered a lot of prejudice, these women showed the world that there was no lack of enthusiasm or desire in them to go to space. They were the role models and paved the way for subsequent generations. To date, nearly 60 women have flown to space, which is only 11% of the total number. Three countries maintain active space programs and have sent women to space, Russia, US, and China. Moreover, women from other countries like Canada, France, India, Iran, Italy, Japan, South Korea, and the UK have flown in Russian and US missions. All these come under developed nations except India and Iran. Besides going to space, today we see women who are rocket scientists, payload experts, astronomers, pilots, geologists, engineers, doctors in space medicine, space entrepreneurs, and the list just goes on. But still, the numbers are lopsided. This can be attributed to the general trend of fewer women taking up careers in STEM. And those who do are more inclined towards uh, electrical and electronics as compared to mechanical or aerospace. The women who pursue higher education and specialize are much less. The key challenge here is changing the perception, perception which is pretty old fashioned. There are still roles identified based on gender, the encouragement that is required for fa from families and educators at every step is much easier to get when you delve into already charted territories. Secondly, there is a definite lack of role models. I believe that Dr. Kalpana Chawla alone would have inspired millions of people in India, especially young girls who went on to pursue, the, uh, pursue a career in STEM. 
We might not recognize the importance of role models, but I'm sure most of us can point out at least one person in our lives who has made a difference into what paths we choose to walk on. Thirdly, policies. Suppose we keep being a military pilot as a required criteria for astronaut selection, then first we need to open the doors in military to the women. Thus, policies should be formed in such a way that women are included in fields which might be relevant prerequisites for space flight. A great step in this direction was taken by the Indian Air Force in 2015 when, in, when it opened Air Force roles for women as fighter pilots, adding to their roles as helicopter pilots. And lastly, change begins at home. If we, don't wa uh, if we want more women in workforce, the burden of unpaid care work must be shared. This is the only way women can balance their professional and personal lives. Coming to what awaits us in the future, and does it look bright? More, now more than 60 years old, human spaceflight has matured from the pioneering days when only the test pilots with the right stuff could venture into the cosmos, and the hidden figures worked in the background. Today, technologies are being developed to extend human exploration beyond the low Earth orbit with the ultimate aim of constructing a permanent international base for scientific research on Mars. This will tremendously impact life here on Earth. Many scientific and technological breakthroughs may be expected, which can find commercial applications leading to creation of new highly skilled jobs and benefiting society. Moreover, technologies which are used for establishing a permanent base on moon on Mars can provide sustainable living in remote and hostile environments on Earth. Exploration will help in understanding our solar systems, uh, solar system and search traces of life, its origin, its evolution, and the possible causes of extinction. It will help in studying long-term effects of space environments on human. And last but not the least, it will inspire and enthuse the next generation of humans who will take it forward. Even though it has all these benefits, human space exploration is highly challenging and expensive. I strongly believe that if humans still find a way to circumvent these issues and go ahead with exploration, women who constitute Roughly half of the population of Earth should be a definite part of it. It is unfortunate that we still don't know how female bodies react to the space environment. For example, after carrying a lot of studies on space travelers, one issue that always cropped up was vision loss in space. This can be a major risk in space flight. So far, all those who have reported these problems are men. And the scientists can't tell if it's because it doesn't affect women as much or because we just haven't flown enough of them to see if it is in this group. Therefore, before venturing into long-term space missions, we need to be absolutely sure and prepared for all imaginable contingencies. It is important to embrace diversity and include more women if we need to continue and sustain human space exploration. Thank you for your time and attention. Okay, uh, thank you, CB. That was a powerful way to end the formal presentations. I do want to give a chance uh, for panelists to follow up with any of the comments that, that you made for each other, and then we'll open it to the floor, and I'll, I'll, stay, I'll hold my question to, to save time. So, yeah, you want to respond to some of your colleagues? Go ahead. Okay, a couple of things. Um, having lived in four different countries and having... Uh, worked with women in aerospace from around the world. I can, I can tell you a few real, very quick factoids. So when I left India in 1996 uh, and went to France, I realized that it was, you know, back home, we were used to having male secretaries. Um, it was not unusual to have administrative assistants who were men. So when I went to Europe and the United States, it was a bit of a cultural shock for me that all secretaries were women, right? So... I think the stereotyping, the hemispherical stereotyping of gender, we need to be able to look beyond that. So I think India leads. If you look at the number of women in ISRO, it's almost 12% of the 16,000 roughly women. I mean, workforce, right? Uh, I think the only other space agency, major space agency, which comes close is NASA. And besides the European Space Agency and the various uh, 
the French, the Italian, the German, and so on. I think over the last 20 years, the number of women has grown. But in that sense, India leads the way when it comes to sort of gender balance in the space agency. The other thing I would like to add is women have advantages. So um, in, in around 2009, when I started talking to diplomats in Washington, D.C., in Delhi, about opening up the possibility of launching American satellites on Indian rockets. I think the fact that I was a woman, I did get asked if I was an American spy or if I was an Indian spy. But the fact that I was a woman was the reason why people were willing to have a casual conversation about something like this, which was a very difficult subject, right? Because we had reached a point between our countries where we were not willing to come to the negotiating table. So I think soft diplomacy is something, it's, I personally felt it was an advantage being a woman. I wasn't seen as a major threat. The other thing I would like to add is, when, I, I think Ashok brought up the whole, uh, I think he did mention patriarchy a few times. So I lived in Sweden. I did my PhD from Sweden. And Sweden is one of those countries that believes that it is one of the most gender equal nations in the world. In my view, I, I, I jokingly tell my Swedish friends that your laws are gender neutral. However, I find that you guys are matriarchal at home and patriarchal in the office. And I often remind people, uh, you know, when I travel and when I work with people from across the world, India cannot be generalized as a continent, as a subcontinent. The more east you go, the more matriarchal and matrilineal it gets. I come from Odessa. So I don't think patriarchy is something that we can sort of generalize for the entire subcontinent. So we have nuances, too, and we need to recognize that. Um, and one last thing. So when I was at NASA Johnson, we ran tests where we were comparing women docking the space station to the shuttle and men. And it seems it's pretty much the same in terms of how efficiently we do it or how skillfully we do it, right? Uh, we also had ran tests where we were trying to see, do women use showers and microgravity better than men? And we did find that the women used showers better than men in microgravity. It's messy, it's complicated, but just, just so you know. Uh, and I think I will uh, leave with one last comment. When you look at international organizations like the International Academy of Astronautics, for example, right? Um, when I got inducted at age 37, it's been some time, uh, I was one of the youngest members. And do you know what was the average age of IAA members then? 67. So you had to either be really old or you would have to wait for someone, um, I mean, forgive me for saying this, to die to actually induct another member. So I find a lot of these organizations, whether it's the World Economic Forum, the International Academy of Astronautics, somewhat outdated. And you know, we need to bring in more lycra and spandex into the equation. And I think that's what we women are here for. Okay, I saw Victoria's hand shoot up immediately. So I'll, I'll give her the floor for a question. Victoria Sam, Secure World Foundation. Um, I just wanted to applaud Serbi's recognition that there are organizational issues that are keeping women back from a lot of these things. Um, I think oftentimes when you talk about um, minorities in, in an issue, whether it's women or ethnic minority or what have you, it, it tends to focus on what can you as a person do. And absolutely there's personal responsibility, but there is organizationally wide systemic responsibility. Um, I know I have a small child, and whenever I go anywhere, the first thing someone asks is, who's taking care of your kid? My male colleagues do not get asked that. Um, but, and I'm lucky that I have that sort of responsibility, but I'm just making that point. I think it's a very good idea to kind of look at that and recognize it is a systemic issue that needs to be taken care of, and it will not take care of itself. You have to take active steps. Um, the other comment I'd like to make, this is a comment about women in space. Um, I have a plea, can we stop talking about manned space systems and talk about crewed space systems? I think it gets the same point across, but as Ashok said, language matters, and it makes a very strong point otherwise. Thank you. Are there other questions on the floor? Okay, well, I have, I have a question. Um, I think in various ways you pointed to the fact, uh, each of you, that we're not really asking 
the right questions. Or some of the questions are just too basic and too obvious, and we don't get nowhere. We don't move forward by asking the same basic questions about why aren't there more women. What would be some better questions that organizations could ask, especially because it's not just an, an Indian and an ISRO challenge. This is a global challenge, and I know everyone is trying to figure out a better way, I hope, to tackle it. So uh, I think on a personal level, uh, I'm not a feminist. You know, I might, uh, you know, uh, put a lot of questions on myself or people will start challenging that. Uh, and I, I do like what, what this lady here said uh, about recognizing the uh, limitation of, uh, you know, diversity candidates, if I were to call women as diversity candidates. I think I'm more of a believer of providing equal opportunities to everybody to grow, right? So, and what does it entail? It entails recognition of limitations of, of every um, employee in the organizations or, or of every kid in a family um, or of you know, every student in a, a academia. So if, if you were to look at what are the basic um, you know, uh, factors that limit these resources or diversity candidates, I think we, if we are able to address to those, we would get our answers. We would address most of the uh, factors that bind uh, you know, from better performance, whether it's choosing um, STEM education or it's uh, you know, identifying what are the factors that limit uh, lady uh, you know, professionals, whether it's you know, having a little kid or working at certain uh, hours. Does it mean it's, it's, it's your handicap? I don't think so, you know. If you are able to address some of those basic logistical issues, you see them performing better than some of the others, you know. And that could be uh, the reasons uh, 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 equally applicable for uh, male officials as well or male uh, performers as well. So I think I'm more of a uh, supporter of providing equal opportunities to diversity candidates. Uh, after you have actually identified what are the uh, what are the limiting uh, factors in their performance, and that is what most of the organizations should be uh, focusing on understanding. If you are able to understand that, uh, I think uh, the the better productivity you are able to get for your own organizations. I think I would like to address the issue of. Um, being a parent and being an aerospace professional. Um, I don't have biological kids myself, but I think what Victoria brought up, and so our company in Vienna, for example, the way we've designed it, because we also have architects amongst us, we've made it child-friendly. So anyone who works for the company could actually, you know, after school, the ch child can come and hang and work and play. So it's a very child-friendly environment. So we've made it by design, right? Because we have a lot of women working in our team. The second thing I would like to mention is um, maternity and paternity leave. Uh, this January, I was in Delhi for a day addressing 150 women who work for the Boston Consulting Group. Uh, the Boston Consulting Group has a total of 600 employees in India. I think thereabouts. So I was talking to the women because uh, uh, that that's what the interaction was about. And they told me that both men and women are given sort of the paternity and maternity leave, but the men refuse to take it. Guess why? The men refuse to take it because what is the message you will send your client? What kind of a man are you? Are you, you taking paternity leave? So it's very interesting. So even in organizations and in geographies where you have this possibility, you have this discrimination in, in terms of should I or shouldn't I take it? Um, I think the other thing I would like to mention is how many women have headed space agencies around the world, right? If you look at the major space agencies, by the way, speaking of English and politics, the word emerging doesn't apply to India and China. Just get it out of the way. I'm so tired of hearing the word emerging. You know, when I moved back to India in 2008, Arthur C. Clarke, who was one of my mentors, he wrote to me saying, Susmita, it's a strategic move. So I said, why do you say that, Arthur? He said, well, everything began in the East, and it's going back there. 
And he gave me the example of gunpowder being invented by Chinese alchemists. No gunpowder, no rockets, guys. So I think emerging should really leave this room as far as India and China are concerned. The Indian space program began in the late 60s. Many of you are not aware of it, but just drop that word. It doesn't belong here. Um, coming back to the, you know, how many women heads of space agencies do we have? Um, does anyone in the room want to answer that question? Maybe Surbi, because you seem really very, very well exposed. And I'm very, very happy to see someone so young and, you know, sort of the future is secure when I see people like Surbi. How, how many women heads of space agencies? Okay. So there have only been two. Yes. So the current head of the German space agency, DLR, is a friend of mine from Vienna. She's an astrobiologist. Imagine an Austrian woman as astrobiologist is heading the German space agency. I mean, it happens, guys. It's Pascal. The other person who headed a space agency before Pascal did is Mas Dr. Maslan Othman. She headed a much smaller space agency, but Malaysian, right? And India, despite having 12% or so women in the workforce, why haven't we had a woman chairman yet? Why haven't we had a woman head any of the major ISRO centers yet? We've had women so which center is that? So when my father was the deputy director of Space Application Center, the other deputy director was a woman, Dr. Rastogi. Okay, so you, you think there has been one, right? Sure, there is one. And two, and another one, and somebody at the deputy director. Yeah, deputy director I know because I grew up with a neighbor auntie who was a... So I think, okay, we, let us say we've had one woman head the, one of the centers of Israel, which is good news. Uh, but it's been 50 years. There's no reason why we haven't had an ISRO chairman who's a woman. Especially given that a lot of our women have gone on to head major satellite programs, rocket programs, so why not be the head of the agency? So I think it's about time. Uh, and in the United States, the most recent one I can remember is Deva Newman, the MIT professor, um, wonderful, wonderful uh, person, explorer, professor. I mean, she was sort of the deputy to Bolden which was fantastic. So I think I am waiting for the day when ISRO will appoint a woman chairperson. And if I look at ESA, the European Space Agency, the last director general, the current one is Werner, he's German, was a French uh, director general. And I think he was there for three terms. Why would you give anyone three terms to head a space agency when there are so many other options, right? So I think as a woman, these are some questions which I think we need to answer for ourselves in the near future. Okay, we're just, uh, we're sort of on the verge of closing, but I want to see if the other panelists want to have a, a final quick sentence and then we'll, and then we'll move to the next session. No? No? I, I feel like you should give us a closing sentence. <laughs> So I think just going back on the point of if assuming that there is a colony on some other planet in the future, right? I think the the way in which we we design uh, our gender friendly policies for that colony is going to be limited by a lot of factors, right? We are going to have a, bun a very tightly knit bunch of people living in small confined spaces for a really long period of time. So the question is, how do we ensure that between them there's trust, there's confidence? And there is no need for uh, a legal intervention, so to say. Right? So I think the preparation for the, the, a future space mission begins now by, by teaching our boys and girls to work together to solve problems, as opposed to looking at each other and saying, hey, this is a girl, she can't do something. This is a boy, he's a threat. So I think we have to fundamentally uh, ask ourselves if as a civilization, if you're serious about colonizing hostile extraterrestrial planets, uh, what is the, the baby steps that we need to take as everyday common men and women to, to make that dream a reality? Thank you. Just a minute, I'd like to The first uh, woman who had it, who was director of uh, ISRO centers was Geeta Vardhan. She directed the National Remote Sen Sensing Center and the Human Space Mission, uh, uh, the Human Space Directorate is also headed by a woman. Dr. Lalita. Lalita Ambeka, yeah. Yes. These so are the top two. Yeah, Lalita Ambika, yes. Uh, Geeta Vardhan was heading um, the okay. National Remote Sensing, uh, Sensing Center. So is it, doesn't she still report to Uli Krishna? So there you go. This is exactly what I'm saying. Someone let's, 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 let's say. No, but she could be the head of a human space program as opposed to... I don't think she reports. 
Okay. I'm, I'm just going to ask if... So I'll just give Suvi an opportunity for a closing word if you want to take it. Yeah. Uh, I would like to say that uh, as uh, 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 Wing Commander Neelu Khatri told that uh, if when we grow up, it it is always it's difficult to change our mind and it'll always crop up that we are like not confident about ourselves. So we should at the when it's little girls and their school levels itself, we should, uh, I think, change the kind of thinking so that it, later at every step, they don't have to fight their own mind. Well, with that, I think we'll wrap up. But thank you so much. This was a, a tremendous conversation, and I hope we can continue it over, over coffee and dinner this evening.